I did something crazy this year at the start of a new year. Um, I decided that I was going to have no sugar. No sugar at all. And that's not easy because I'm addicted to sugar. I love sugar and I find it particularly difficult on the nights I'm home after dinner because sitting down at night chewing on a carrot is nowhere near as good as smashing down a chocolate bar. But I do realise it's taken me a while that sugar is not good for me. So I'm just trying to make a change to be a healthier version of myself in 2024. Part of that change this year is the realisation that the outer me is being shaped all the time whether I like it or not. Wouldn't it be great if you could do all that you wanted and eat as much as you wanted and the more you ate, the fitter and leaner you became. But we all know that's not the reality. The reality is our outer self is being shaped continually by our daily decisions. Our outer self, what you see before you today, is a sum total of my age, my genetics, my diet, the amount of food I eat, when I eat, how much I exercise, the environment I have in my life, how much I sleep. All of those factors are constantly at work shaping the outer version of ourselves. And we can't live our lives without intentionality in the physical area of life and expect to be physically healthy. We know this from a physical point of view, but sometimes we neglect our inner self and we wonder why we feel distant from God and why we're out of shape spiritually. Because the truth is that your inner you and me is being constantly shaped whether we like it or not. It's being shaped by our thoughts, our feelings, our circumstances. It's being formed through our attitudes, our words, the choices we make, as well as our courage, our love and our devotion. We are being shaped all of the time. That is inevitable. We can't control that. But what we can control is whether it happens on purpose or by accident. If we're to become the people that God is calling us to be, our intimacy with God will be the factor that determines who we become more than anything else in life. I love what Dallas Willard says. He says, the main thing God gets out of your life is the person you become. The main thing God gets out of your life is the person you become. So often we define our lives by the things that we do, the ministry we achieve, the job we do, the friends we have, the business we build, the career we pursue, the family we raise. And these are all important things. But what God is most interested in is the person that we become. The people God wants us to become are people who reflect the character of Jesus, His Son. 2 Corinthians chapter 3.18 tells us that the journey of faith is one where we are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so as we walk with God, the Holy Spirit is changing us from the inside out to become more like Jesus. If in 2024, you achieve nothing else other than becoming more like Jesus, it would actually change everything else in significant ways. At Follow, the church I pastor, we define discipleship following Jesus with the acronym IOU. IOU stands for Inward, Outward and Upward. And it really talks about what holistic discipleship looks like. Inward is the way that we journey together as a a family of believers, the way we love and encourage and support one another. Outward is our kingdom mission to take the good news of Jesus to a world that so desperately needs it. But if we're to have any success inwardly, together in our love for one another and outwardly through passionate mission, it must all flow from our upward connection and intimacy with God. You and I as Christians have been blessed to be a blessing to the world. And when we spend time with God, He fills us up. He pours His presence into our life. I love what Psalm 16 verse 5 says. It says, Lord, You alone are my portion and my cup. As we develop intimate relationship with God in His Word, through a life of prayer and by prioritising time in His presence, He fills us so that we can then share with others from the overflow of love in our lives. But if we don't prioritise 
that relationship time with God, if we don't go to God to be filled by His Spirit, we may still try to encourage one another and reach out to those who don't know Jesus. But in our own strength, we soon have nothing left to give. The disciple you become will be shaped most profoundly by your upward relationship with God. It's time with God that will shape your life and character more than anything else. Tonight I want to talk about intimacy with God. The title of the message is From a Holy Mountain to a Mountain of Mess. And our Bible passage tonight from the book of 1 Kings 19 seems like a strange story and a weird passage to share around intimacy with God. It tells the story of a man called Elijah, who God gives a great victory to on a place called Mount Carmel. But just shortly after that, he ends up on another mountain called Mount Horeb, and his life is a mountain of mess. What I love about this biblical account is the relatability of Elijah and his relationship with God. Elijah is probably the most famous prophet in the entire Old Testament. He spoke God's Word to his people. He performed miracles. He raised the dead. But perhaps his most famous encounter happened on Mount Carmel. At the time, Ahab was the king of Israel. And like many of the kings at that time, he led Israel into idol worship of the false god Baal. Elijah, as a prophet, was very vocal in his criticism of Ahab's leadership. And Ahab and his wife Jezebel hated not only Elijah, but all of God's prophets, so much so that Jezebel had been hunting them down and assassinating them. All of this came to a standoff on Mount Carmel. And some of you would be familiar with the story. Elijah tells Ahab the king to summon all the people of Israel to the mountain, along with 450 prophets of Baal. And he challenges the Israelites on who they will choose to follow. Are you going to follow God or are you going to follow Baal? And he says, here's the challenge. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take two bulls. You choose one, you prophets, you choose one. And I'll take the other one. We're going to cut them into pieces. We're going to place them on wood for a fire. And then we're going to pray for God to provide the fire. And whichever God answers with fire is the true God worth following. So they agree to the challenge. The Baal prophets went first. And from morning to noon, they desperately pleaded with their God Baal to respond to their prayers, but there was no answer. Elijah mocked them all day. He said, maybe your God is asleep or on the toilet. Maybe he's too busy travelling. But by noon, there was no answer. Elijah then told the people to fill four big jugs of water and pour it all over his bull. He then told them to do that two more times. Then he stepped forward to pray to God. And as soon as he prayed, the fire of the Lord fell. It burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones. It licked up every bit of water until there was nothing left. As a result, all the false prophets of Baal were taken and put to death. Ahab was stunned, but Jezebel was furious. And this is where it brings us to in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. Now, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. And then it says, Elijah, this great man of God, was afraid and ran for his life. It's incredible, isn't it? Elijah's just had this unbelievable, remarkable victory on Mount Carmel. God has answered his prayer. He's performed a miracle. He's had a victory over all these false prophets. But in the next breath, Jezebel threatens him and he runs for his life. Isn't this so much like us? Times in our life where God answers prayer, He does miracles. He turns our life around and we, our faith is built up and we have all this confidence in God. But five minutes later, something goes wrong. He doesn't answer a prayer. And all the faith we have evaporates and it's replaced by fear. This is exactly what happened for Elijah. One minute he's on Mount Carmel. The next minute he's at Mount Horeb hiding in a cave. And I get it. Jezebel was a scary lady. Just recently on Netflix, there was a series called Griselda. I don't know if anyone saw that. It was about a lady called Griselda Blanco. 
You may never have heard of her, but you may have heard her nickname. She is known as the Black Widow or the Godmother. She was a Colombian lady, heavily involved in the drug trade. And after a conflict with her husband in Colombia, she shot him dead. And as a result, fled the country, headed to Miami with her three boys to start a new life. In a new country, it was hard to make ends meet and provide for her children. It wasn't long before she gravitated back into the world of drugs. And in an industry dominated by male gangsters, at first she wasn't taken seriously. But bit by bit, her influence spread and grew. Her power expanded and Griselda Blanco strategically took out all the other drug dealers in Miami and became the most feared drug trafficker in all of America. Colombian drug lord Pablo Escobar once famously said, the only man I was ever afraid of was a woman named Griselda Blanco. Griselda was eventually assassinated at the age of 69. You live by the sword, you often die by it but not before being charged with the murder of over 200 people. She was a ruthless killer who pursued her enemies and eliminated them one by one. Jezebel was an ancient equivalent. And Elijah, he didn't fear Ahab, but he was terrified of Jezebel. She eliminated anybody that stood in the way of her empire and the biggest threat were the prophets of God because they spoke against the false worship of Baal that her and her husband Ahab were demanding of the Israelites. And so before Mount Carmel, she'd been tracking down the prophets of God and killing them by the sword. But the prophet she hated the most was Elijah. He was at the top of the tree because he was the figurehead of all the prophets that opposed her and Ahab and spoke God's word against them. As a result, he became the number one target to be eliminated, hence the death threat that she intended to carry out within 24 hours. She was a scary lady. And this great man of God, Elijah, was afraid and he ran for his life. When he arrived at his destination, a place called Judah, it says he left his servant there while he himself went to journey, a day's journey into the wilderness. Now, when you hear the word wilderness in Scripture, stop and take note. It's a significant word. Typically in Scripture, it represents a place of God's presence. The wilderness, you may remember, is where God led His people after their escape from Egypt through the Exodus. And for 40 years, they trekked through the wilderness where He led them by His Spirit with a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. It was a place where God shaped His people in significant ways as they journeyed with Him. When Jesus commenced His earthly ministry, after His baptism, like we saw tonight, the very first thing that happened is that the Spirit led Him into the wilderness, the desert, where for 40 days and nights he was tempted by the devil. It's a time of preparation for his ministry as he learned to rely on the strength of his heavenly Father. And so in this story tonight, we see another example of a biblical character heading into the wilderness. And we could easily think, oh, well, we just assume that Elijah's doing that just to get further away from Jezebel. But that's not what the context points to because the first thing he does when he gets there is he talks to God. And as he starts to talk to God, it becomes clear very quickly that Elijah's life is in a bit of a mess. It says, Elijah came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. He says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. This is a short time before. He was standing on a mountaintop with faith and victory over the prophets of Baal. But now in the very next chapter, he's standing on another mountain and his life is a mountain of mess. And he's so low and he's so depressed that he wants his life to end. In a strange way, we can find encouragement here. And what we can take from this is that we don't have to be in a good place before we take time to be in God's presence. In the despair and hopelessness, God meets Elijah exactly where he's at. Sometimes as Christians, we think it needs to be all beer and Skittles and rainbows and unicorns before we can go to God's presence, because if not, we don't deserve it. But I wanna tell you tonight, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Don't allow the devil to rob you of being in God's presence because you think you're not good enough. When you go into God's presence, He will meet you exactly where you're at. So I love about God. You can come to Him anytime, 24 hours a day, as we heard tonight. 
It's time with God that will truly grow us as disciples. And there's three things that happen for Elijah in this story that we can experience in our relationship with God as well. The first thing is this, in God's presence, we find provision. When we look at Bible characters, we often see them as superheroes that are different to us. Dallas Willard makes this point in his book called Hearing God. He says that we often read these stories and we think that they just aren't human. By this, we mean that their experience, including their experience of God, is not like ours. And perhaps they are even some special kind of people, so our experience could never be like this. But I don't think that's how we should read the Bible stories. Because I think as we look more deeply, there is so much of their stories that are relatable in our story. Maybe this evening you can relate to the place of despair that Elijah finds himself in, so low and discouraged that maybe you're not sure how you can go on. Personally, I feel I can relate to this in recent years. In fact, the journey of planting our church, Follow Baptist, had a Mount Carmel and then a Mount Horeb feel to it in the first six years. The first four years of our church plant, personally for me, was a dream come true. Like everything went right. God's hand was on everything we did. We had a passionate group of 30 people that came together to launch Follow. It grew faster than we could ever imagine, growing to 10 times that amount pre-COVID. People came to know the Lord. Many grew in their faith. We had heaps of people baptised. We launched our own charity. It was just incredible to see what God was doing. We believed that we were having impact in our community and the name of Jesus was being lifted high over our region. That was the first four years. But years five and six felt exactly opposite to that. There was theological disagreement in our church over women in ministry. A lot of people didn't want women to serve in ministry and over 120 people left our church. People that I thought I'd be journeying with forever. Man, that was painful relationally. COVID hit just after that. More people left. There was breakdown and turnover on our staff. It was relationally painful. Personally, my wife Kim had another round of open heart surgery. My son was struggling with diabetes. Due to all the stress, I got Bell's palsy in my face and literally half of my face stopped working. I would drink a cup of water and it would go out the other side of my mouth. If you work in a factory stacking shelves, you can probably get away with that. If you're a preacher and you're always on a platform, it's a really scary place to be. You think, is my face ever gonna come back? It was a difficult time. I had to have six weeks off, stress leave. Never had anything like that before. Upon return, I had trauma counselling. And just as I was working through the emotional strain, one of my best friends experienced tragedy when his young son had an asthma attack and passed away. All this happened within an 18-month period. I didn't even know whether we'd have a church coming back out of COVID. I was confused and heartbroken, disappointed, hurt, fearful for the future. At times, I didn't even know if I wanted to go on in more ways than one. From a Mount Carmel experience in those first four years, where we rejoiced in God's faithfulness, I found myself on a mountain of despair that felt more like Mount Horeb, where I can relate even in a small way to what Elijah was feeling. And maybe you've been there as well. Perhaps you're there right now. And I hope tonight that you're encouraged because for Elijah, when he retreated to God's presence, God met him right where he was at. And he provided exactly what he needed in that moment. Look at verse four. It says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some break bread over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and he drank and he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank and strengthened by that food, he travelled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and he spent the night. See, Elijah didn't know what he needed to continue, but God did. And what he needed in that moment of his life was a good rest, water and a feed. And God provided that. And in that moment, this is what he needed to get up and to keep going on the journey. As I look back on that difficult season in my own life, in a similar way to Elijah, there was only one thing that got me through and that was time in God's presence. I didn't retreat to a cave. 
but I did gravitate to a gazebo next to a lake near my house. This is what it looks like. And I still visit there frequently today. It's become my solitary place, my wilderness spot. And I would make my way to this solitary place. I would leave my phone at home. I would shut off all the external noise because in that season of my life, the noise was deafening. People's opinions, the criticisms, Dan Andrews' press conferences. If I heard another one of those, I was gonna jump in the lake. And so I left my phone at home because we are a distracted generation. And I wanted to just spend time with God. I didn't really know what I needed, to be honest. Some days I just felt so numb that all I could do was sit there for an hour and watch the ducks. Other days I muttered confused and difficult prayers to God, like the one Elijah managed to get out. Other days God spoke to me as I opened His Word. And many times it was the exact spiritual food I needed for that day to get up and continue on the journey. I didn't always know what I needed. The noise in the world in my life was deafening at the time, but when I retreated into God's presence, He met me right where I was at and He provided what I needed each day. And I wholeheartedly believe that those times in God's presence are the only reason I'm still going today. They were that pivotal. I wish someone taught me as a young adult the power of silence and solitude, of being with God, because for me, I think it changed my life. And I believe He can do that in all of our lives. This year, as we prioritise time with Him, He can meet you right where you're at, even if you feel like a mess. Psalm 16, 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. In His presence, we find provision. But the second thing that happens in God's presence is that our character is refined. John Altberg, the former teaching pastor of Willow Creek, a busy mega church, once went to his mentor, Dallas Willard, and he asked him, what do I need to do to be spiritually healthy? After a long pause, Dallas said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. He said, okay, I'm writing that down, what else? And he said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Life can often be super busy. And one of the impacts of a hurried life that we all know about is we make little to no time for self-reflection. Where we open ourselves up to God and allow Him to speak into our lives. When we do, God speaks and He's always speaking, but in the busyness, we're not always listening. Sometimes when He speaks, it's words of encouragement and inspiration, but other times it's words of rebuke and conviction that require repentance and change. And for Elijah in the cave at Mount Horeb, this is precisely what happened. He retreated into God's presence, into the wilderness to spend time with God. And when he did, verse 9 says that the Word of the Lord came to him. And the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? The question is designed to stimulate self-reflection. What was Elijah doing there? Well, it doesn't take much to see in the text that Elijah's there because of fear. He's there wallowing in self-pity and loneliness. He's there because he's lost sight of who God is and has forgotten all that God has done. And when God first asked him the question, he actually doesn't see any of those issues. He just states the facts. In verse 10, Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. The thing is that God didn't need the facts. God already knew exactly what was going on. God didn't say, oh, really? I I didn't realise that was going on. Thank you for letting me know. Now I can do something about it. No, no, He knows everything about us. I believe God was calling Elijah, like He does with us, to a place of self-reflection. And Elijah's not there yet. And so God says to him, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. And I'm sure Elijah's thinking, the big wind's coming, this must be God. God, I'll find him in the spectacular. But it says that the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. Maybe this is God. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, 
came a gentle whisper. In the difficult times of life, it's often hard to hear God. When wind of change sweeps through our lives, it can be disorientating and confusing. When tragedies and events shake our faith, it's often hard to hear God. When the fire of conflict is blazing, we ask God, where are you? Why is this happening? Elijah couldn't hear God in the wind, the earthquake, the fire, the fear, the worry, the confusion. But in his retreat into the wilderness, in the quietness, he did hear God's small, still voice. You know, as Christians, we often look for God in the visible and the dramatic and the spectacular. We want to hear his voice in the worship service. I've heard that God always comes to the young adult service at One Hope. So we come here and we're going to hear from God. And it's going to be spectacular. You've got a guest speaker. That's extra special. I'm sure you're disappointed. <laughs> the Youth Alive rally, the prayer meeting, that's where we'll hear God. But I've found that the most profound and life-shaping moments for me personally have happened in the stillness where God still speaks in a small, still voice. Many times at that little gazebo, there are times of inspiration and refreshment. They are most often though, times of self-reflection and repentance. In the quietness of those moments, God speaks about the things that need refining in our lives. And when that happens, we have a choice to either ignore what He's saying, to justify our behaviour, divert blame to others, or alternatively, we can humbly accept what He asks of us and rely on His help to change. I've found that discipleship following Jesus is both a beautiful and a painful journey. It's painful when you look in the mirror and you realise that we're all a work in progress. <laughs> We've got a long way to go. But it's beautiful as you see God refine and transform your character. This is what happens as we make space for God in our lives. Interestingly, God asked Elijah the same question twice. Once before the wind, earthquake and fire and once after. And the question was, what are you doing here, Elijah? And I'm not convinced that Elijah did the self-reflection God was asking of him. And as a result of this encounter, God asked Elijah to go and appoint Elisha to succeed him as prophet. And I wonder, I can't help but wonder whether that happened earlier than it could have because Elijah didn't recognise why he was in the wilderness and what needed to change. You know, I've got to say, in all honesty, throughout COVID, I was pretty disappointed when I looked at the behaviour of Christians. We seem to be the most fearful people on the planet. We have a God that created all things, can do all things, and yet we seem to freak out more than anybody else. And what I noticed in that time is that discipleship in the church is really lacking. And I think it's because of emotional immaturity because we don't spend time with God. Pete Scazzaro says, you'll never grow spiritually while remaining emotionally immature. God has a plan and purpose for each of our lives. I'm so convinced of that. But your character, it's your character that will unleash your calling. In fact, your character will either propel you or expel you from what God has for you. And so don't ever let your calling outgrow your character. Spending time in God's presence is what safeguards us from that and instead propels us forward into all the things God has for our lives. In God's presence, our character is refined. Finally tonight, in God's presence, we find clarity. At the start of the chapter, Elijah is running for his life and through his lack of trust has created space between him and God. Now, last year I had the privilege of going to the UK for my brother's wedding. He got married just outside of London. It's the second time I've been to London. I must say of all the places I've travelled in my lifetime, London is just about my favourite city. I love that it's a beautiful place, a beautiful blend of the ancient and the modern. I love that everywhere you walk, you find another iconic building or monument that you've seen on movies. So one minute you'll be at the Big Bear, the next minute you're at the Tower of London, in the distance will be the Eye. Then you'll be at King's Cross Station, Tower Bridge or streets with Monopoly names. The food's not great, the coffee's terrible, but you can put up with that because the people are friendly. But one of the best parts of the city is how easy it is to get around. London Tube is a brilliant network. The trains run literally every two minutes. 
One morning I looked at the train timetable when I was there and it said, expect extreme delays. And I thought, oh no, I'm not here for long. I'm going to be stuck here all day. And then it said, delay seven minutes. In Metro on a Monday morning, if your train is only delayed seven minutes, you know it's going to be a good week, right? It's like a dream come true. But when trains go every two minutes, seven minutes is like a crisis. I chuckled in the UK. I watched people sprint for the trains in London, all sweaty and flustered when they miss it. Literally, there's another one in two minutes. Just chill out. <laughs> but I will say the trains are always packed. They're crammed in like sardines. They smell a bit like sardines as well. There's no air conditioning in the underground and you swelter all through the UK summer. Those three days are unbearable. And after travelling on the underground for a couple of weeks, there are now nine words that are forever burned on my brain as a result of my time in London. These are the words. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. They say it a couple of times as you're coming up to every station. They say it about three times when you stop. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. These words are so iconic in London that they sell T-shirts that say, mind the gap. And I wanted to buy one, but they were insanely expensive. But they want you to recognise that there's a gap there and then mind the gap because if you don't, you could break your leg or worse and they really care about you and they don't want to be sued. And I'm not sure if it's in the right order. But those words are burned on my brain. Mind the gap. And they're words worth remembering when it comes to our relationship with God because sometimes God feels distant but it's not actually him who's moved. It's us. The book of James says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. But when we don't mind the gap between us and God, we often end up confused and lost. Elijah hadn't minded the gap between him and God. He was running from Jezebel, yes, but he was also running from God. And at the start of this chapter, he doesn't know where to go or what to do. But the chapter ends with him in the wilderness, hearing God's voice and knowing exactly what to do and where to go. After hearing God's voice, the confusion clears and he finds clarity in verses 15 to 17. And the direction he gets is to turn back around, to face the issues head on with courage, confidence and boldness because everything he needs will be provided by God. When we face decisions, rushing rarely leads to good ones. But waiting on the Lord in His presence, is of utmost importance. We're told to commit ourselves to the Lord. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, you'll know it well. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to Him and He will make your paths straight. In the difficult season I went through, clarity eventually came, but it took time for the fog to lift and God asked so many questions of my character in that season. He didn't ask me questions just once. Sometimes he had to ask me the same questions over and over again before I understood and accepted what he was saying. And in some of those areas, it required repentance and change. And so I wanna finish by asking you a question tonight because maybe he's asking questions of your life as well. And so what is God asking of you at the start of a new year? Sometimes it's about your commitment to him. Sometimes it's areas of your character that need refining. Sometimes it's things in your life that need to change. Sometimes it's decisions that you need to make, but you're feeling confused by. But when we spend time in God's presence, He provides clarity to a humble heart. And it all flows from our upward relationship with a God who loves us and desires to connect with us. The story of Elijah is an Old Testament one. But in the New Testament, God Himself is revealed in the person of Jesus who was so eager to reach us that He left the glory of heaven and He stepped into the mess we created. And He's described in Scripture as Emmanuel, God with us. And through His Spirit, He's not only with us, but He dwells in us. And He wants relationship with each one of you. He wants conversation. And Hebrews tells us that we can confidently approach our God. So friends, we can now without hesitation, walk right up to God into the holy place. Jesus has cleared the way by the blood of His sacrifice, acting as our priest before God. The curtain into God's presence is His body. God's greatest present for you in 2024 is His presence. And so this year, 
prioritise your upward relationship with God and He will provide what you need. He will refine your character and make you more like Jesus and He will bring clarity into your life. And if you're to do that, I believe that 2024 can be the biggest growth year of your journey so far. I'm going to invite the worship team forward. We're going to close in song in just a moment. But I just want to pray in a moment because I really sense as I was preparing this message that there's some people here that you've been on a roundabout of faith for years. It's the same old things going around over and over again, the same character issues that keep coming to the surface, the same fears and worries and concerns. And you're like on this roundabout that you're stuck on. And I believe tonight that God wants to speak into your heart and say, enough. The devil has stolen, he has killed, he's destroyed more than he should. And this year, you're going to take authority over the devil. You're going to get off the roundabout and get on the highway as you follow Jesus. And so as we sing tonight, I just want you to maybe close your eyes and consider what are the things, what are the questions that God's asking you at the start of a new year? And as you come to Him, I believe that He can change your life this year. So we're going to finish in song. Um, I'm happy to pray for anyone. If you want prayer in any area tonight around this, about being in God's presence and character and those sorts of things, then I'll be down the front. I'd love to pray for any of you. But thanks for having me. Let's finish by praising God tonight. Thanks. Thanks.